The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Thank you for coming. I uh, want to thank the folks at John Jay. This is the second time we've hosted a breakfast here. The first was uh, with Deputy Mayor Bob Steele last year where he announced uh, the Wired NYC initiative, which has gone on to be a very uh, important uh, part of uh, our city in terms of infrastructure. Um, this is an incredible building, uh, worth a tour afterwards if you, if you want to have one. And uh, it's uh, relatively new and uh, part of the whole expanding west side, so thank you for coming over here. Um, our speaker is a man who's dedicated himself to our city uh, and our country. Uh, Cy Vance was first uh, inaugurated as the District Attorney of New York County in 2012. Um, and he has transformed the office to be a national leader in criminal justice by expanding the office's expertise on an array of 21st century crimes, including identity theft, cybercrime, white collar fraud, hate crimes, terrorism, domestic violence, human trafficking, and violent and gang related crimes. As DA, Cy's many achievements include the takedown of many uh, numerous violent street gangs as witnessed last week with the great cooperation of, of the NYPD and other agencies. Uh, how many people were arrested last week? 100, over 103 uh, gang, uh, gang members. Uh, Cy has recovered billions of dollars from international financial institutions that have engaged in violating international sanctions for the benefit of countries like Iran, Libya, and Sudan. Sai was reelected in 2013 and began his second term earlier this year. Abney has always worked closely with the NYPD and other law enforcement uh, officials, and we are thrilled to work closely with you and your team, Sai, uh, helping them, helping our city become a better place uh, to live, work, and visit. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my pleasure to introduce Manhattan District Attorney Sai Vance. Bill, thank you very much for uh, your remarks and thank Abney especially for the invitation uh, to come and speak with you. And I also want to thank John Jay. Uh, Jeremy Travis and John Jay are, are one of the most important partners that our office has in, in experimentations and programs that we are developing uh, to make New York City safer. And uh, Jeremy is a great partner and a great friend. But let me just start with a uh, a little more recognition of Abney, because uh, this is really one of the institutions that I think has brought New York City back. Um, I started being as a lawyer in the uh, 1980s, and about 10 years before that, uh, New York City was in a very different spot. Pundits were predicting the downfall of our city. Uh, I know you remember crime was bad. It was getting worse. Our budgets were being broken. And New York, it appeared, and some said, had become ungovernable. And it was at that point in time, that truly significant point in time, when Lou Rudin came in and started to bring others to work together to turn New York around. Uh, he prepaid his real estate taxes. Uh, he gave confidence to the business community that we could invest in New York, and we could, in fact, return to a city that was uh, safe for our families, uh, a good environment for our businesses. And looking now at 2014, I think it's fair to say, Bill, we would not be here without your father. I would not be here. We would not be here without uh, Abney uh, and your work in making sure that our community stays together and works well. So thank you. And one of the key focuses that Lou Rudin and Abney and its members focused on was public safety and crime. And everyone in this room knows that public safety essentially is the key to a successful city. When you have it, a city can grow. When you don't have it, a city can decline. And although the business community and the DA's community uh, represent vastly different fields, uh, we have, I think, a mutual desire to innovate, to proactively seek out new opportunities to advance your and our missions, and to invest invest in this great city 
Uh, and so we share common pursuits in the Manhattan DA's office with Abney's members and the business community and the greatest enterprises in the city who are part of the Abney family. As New Yorkers, we all know and feel that businesses get better here in New York by being proactive, and businesses simply can't survive by resting on their laurels. This is, in New York City today, I believe, the most vibrant and competitive marketplace in the world, and the world has ever known. And what that means to us, I think, is from the corner of Bodega on up, Manhattan and New York is not the kind of place or market where you can just sit and wait for business or change to come to you. And that's true whether you are a uh, restaurant in Harlem, an elite fashion house in the garment district, a tech startup in the Flatiron District, or a multinational media conglomerate in Manhattan. The same applies to my business, public safety, and to law enforcement. In our office, we are constantly seeking to find new ways to keep up with the new ways that people commit crimes. So we just can't react to what's happening on the streets. We have to be proactive using now 21st century data analysis to individuals who are drive, identifying individuals who are driving crime throughout the city, and most importantly, to be proactive in trying to get them off the streets. Then we take the proceeds of that misconduct and we invest them back into our communities and into strategies that will help us keep New York City even safer. I came into office in January of 2010, and at that point in time, crime was at a historic low in New York City. And when I say crime was low, I mean lower than anyone had previously imagined it could be. So first of all, thank you, New York City Police Department. Thank you, Dick Brown. Thank you, Danny Donovan, and thank you, Bob Morgenthau. You've done a great job. As have so many of the people in this room. But when I took office in 2010, I saw a dichotomy in the city of New York and in Manhattan. There was a sense of safety because violence had, in fact, declined. But lives were still being lost daily in barrages of gunfire around Manhattan and around New York. The year I became DA in 2010, there were 234 shooting victims in Manhattan and 70 homicides. Now, granted, that was a 90% reduction in homicides from the time when I had been assistant district attorney in this office years ago. But the fact that we lived in the safest big city in the country today was of no consolation whatsoever to the victims of those families involved in those homicides or shooting incidents. So when I became DA, it was my pledge to reduce violent crime even further. And I began with the idea that if the DA's office was going to play a role in driving crime even lower than it was when I got into office, that progress was unlikely to be achieved unless our office modernized its approach. And that's how what in our office we call intelligence or data-driven prosecution started. And let me tell you what that means. For decades, when the police arrested someone, Manhattan prosecutors, and I as a young DA was one of them, essentially viewed our job as building the case that the police gave us, going to court, doing your level best to try to get a conviction, and then moving on to the next case. And that's understandable. Violent crime in the 1980s was so rampant, it was all we could do simply to keep up with the volume of cases that were overwhelming us. But the consequence of that is often as a result, we didn't have time to think about a case in the context of the community outside the courtroom. Thankfully, when I ran for DA, violent crime had decreased. And I saw in that time an opportunity for our office to push crime even lower. And in doing so, it was important to me that our assistant DAs take responsibility for and be proud of themselves of their ability to reduce crime in neighborhoods around Manhattan through proactive initiatives of our office. At this same time in 2010, across our city, public agencies, private partners, and civic groups were unlocking the power of big data to spur innovation and improve the delivery and quality of municipal services. At that time, as you will remember, the city was deploying new analytics-based systems to attack problems as ingrained and as diverse as structural safety, emergency response, economic development, and tax enforcement and was achieving staggering results in that process. 
In 2010, New York City was a national laboratory for a full-blown data revolution, and we were experiencing the most significant public sector advancements in a generation. Most importantly for our work in the DA's office, the NYPD had emerged as a worldwide leader in data-driven policing. When Police Commissioner Bratton implemented CONSTAT in 1994, the police reset their entire operational focus. They then began to identify the people and locations actually driving crime. The NYPD built an international model for harnessing and analyzing crime data, empowering departments across the globe to redeploy resources where they could be most effective. The DA's office needed, in my opinion, to take what we had learned from Comstat and apply it to our own crime-fighting strategies. So in our first year in office in 2010, we assembled what we call the Crime Strategies Unit to be the functioning arm of our intelligence and data-driven prosecution strategy. It's something similar to, but in many ways very different from, Comstat. Now the Crime Strategies Unit is the first of its kind in a prosecutor's office. Like Comstat, the Crime Strategies Unit identifies the crime drivers and crime hotspots block by block, building by building, neighborhood by neighborhood around Manhattan. But that's just the beginning. CSU collects, connects, and analyzes that and other data from seemingly unrelated cases. It makes sense of the enormous data that comes into our office and creates actionable intelligence and pushes that intelligence to the ADAs throughout the DA's office, who use that to make stronger investigations and stronger trials. Data is one of our biggest assets as a DA's office, and it's also one of our biggest challenges. An office as large as ours collects massive amounts of data and intelligence as we investigate and prosecute over 100,000 cases a year. And to give you a point of comparison, that's more cases in a year than the entire United States Department of Justice handles nationwide. Uh, now, the police may make a gun arrest and hold that defendant for 24 hours between arrest and handing that case over to our office. But we may keep that case for 18 months. And in that 18 months, interview witnesses, determine where the gun was sold from, who it was sold to, other intelligence about gang activity in the neighborhood. So before we built CSU, that kind of intelligence was simply scattered across thousands of legal pads in the offices of hundreds of DAs. So before CSU, two shootings committed in the same neighborhood might be prosecuted by two different attorneys in two different bureaus, located in two different bureau in buildings, and those very capable ADAs might try cases in two adjacent courtrooms, but never know that the defendants they were both prosecuting were related to the same gang. So we built CSU to break down those silos and to enable us to organize, share, and gather this actionable intelligence. And we do this in full partnership with the NYPD, other law enforcement agencies throughout the city, and we do so with full support and the help of our communities, who are now working directly with our attorneys in the Crime Strategies Unit to let us know what they're seeing in the neighborhoods that we are trying to protect. Now, after four years, the question is, does the Crime Strategies Unit work? And I believe the answer is unequivocally yes. In my first term, homicides in Manhattan fell by 44 percent and shootings by 42 percent. And I am particularly proud of the way that we've used data-driven prosecution strategies to bring down violent crime. Working closely with CSU, a unit in our office, the Violent Criminal Enterprises Unit, has brought 19 indictments against gun traffickers, 14 indictments along with the trial division against gang members, taken more than 900 illegal guns off the streets, guns that now can't be used to shoot at police officers or point at kids, and prosecuted more than 300 gang members. Overall, violence in Manhattan has declined precipitously, precipitously since 2010. And I believe and I see that we have reclaimed many communities, many buildings, many corners, many blocks, our neighborhoods back to the people who live there and who want simply to be able to send their kids to school, to walk to the grocery store, and to be in peace with their families. This data-driven approach also helps us target the places where crime has been concentrated. Last April, after a lengthy investigation, we indicted three gangs in East Harlem, 
in the Johnson Wagner uh, houses over in East Harlem who had been warring with each other for years. And in a pattern that is all too familiar, some slight, some incident, and it happened in 2009, and that precipitated a gang warfare where gang members gathered together and committed acts of homicide, conspired with young kids to commit other acts of homicide and attempted murder, and it was an all-out bloody warfare for too long. Our office came in working with the NYPD and um, in our trial division, uh, we indicted 62 gang members from those three gangs. And that was a year ago. In the year following, all 62 members, all 62 defendants are now pleaded guilty. Uh, and the reason 62 defendants in a case plead guilty is because there is nowhere for them to go. These cases, fueled by data, fueled by information and intelligence brought to us by the Crime Strategies Unit, helps us build strong cases. Cases that really require the individuals who are charged, if the evidence um, is, is, is uh, put before a jury, uh, to understand that the likelihood of conviction is very high. Now, before this gang takedown in East Harlem, in that same zone, uh, there had been seven homicides in the preceding two or three years, 46 non-fatal shootings, that's people hit with bullets, uh, in just that little area of East Harlem. But since that gang takedown in the year following, there have been just two homicides and three non-fatal shootings. Now, any homicide in any neighborhood is unacceptable. But if I can go from uh, 17 to two, and get that kind of change uh, in violent crime in a neighborhood, we're going in the right direction. And as Bell indicated, you could also look at our work last uh, week in the Manhattanville and Grant Houses in West Harlem. Last Wednesday, following a very long investigation uh, led by the Crime Strategies Unit and our Violent Criminal Enterprises Unit, we announced uh, the largest gang takedown in New York City history, charging 103 defendants from three different gangs. And those gangs, like in East Harlem, uh, these members are being accused of uh, being responsible for at least two murders, 19 shootings, and 50 shooting incidents in recent years. Disturbingly, about a quarter of these defendants are under 18 years old. And for years in West Harlem, families in that neighborhood had been trying to go about their daily lives, but were held hostage by bullets being shot throughout the Grant and Manhattanville houses. And this was simply because local gangs were engaged in shark versus jets warfare. Some slight had happened four or five years ago, and gangs started to shoot gang for retribution. It was violence for violence sake. It wasn't about money. It was about turf. Now, the goal of this crime strategies unit is to take players like these off the streets en masse. And we do that now based on sound data analysis and in the furtherance of an overarching goal to reduce violence. And we see time and time again that removing these crime drivers, people who cause a disproportionate amount of crime in a neighborhood, uh, can lead to an immediate positive impact on public safety and economic development in those neighborhoods. This is especially true, I believe, when we form new and innovative partnerships with the NYPD, as we have. And as some of you may have read last week in the New York Times, my office and the NYPD has teamed up on a new initiative that Bill Bratton describes as extreme collaboration. What is extreme collaboration? It's collaboration on steroids. And Bill used this example when he was talking to one of the reporters. Collaboration, this is extreme collaboration. It is binding our two agencies with common strategies and common objectives to make sure that we are both walking in the same direction, aware of what each other is trying to do. And I think this marks a new era of cooperation between us. With murder rates at historic lows, our agencies are now walking in lockstep to apply proactive strategies to target persistent crimes, now no longer violence, but like identity theft, grand larceny, narcotics, and domestic violence. So we're going to take the strategies that we've used to effectively reduce violence in Manhattan, and we're now going to apply them in collaboration with the NYPD on other areas where we now should be turning our focus. So I believe our intelligence-driven strategy works. It's taken many of our worst offenders off the streets, and we have remade Manhattan, I believe, into a national model for innovative, proactive 21st century crime fighting. Today, 
jurisdictions as far flung as San Francisco and Delaware and many in between are working with my office to replicate the Crime Strategies Unit in their jurisdictions. And you can already find a brand new Crime Strategies Unit right across the river in Brooklyn and one developing in Danny Donovan's office in Staten Island. But I understand, like many of you do, that effective crime fighting is not just about who you take out of a neighborhood, who you prosecute. It's also very much about what you put back into the neighborhood. And we've all come to realize that you can't arrest your way out of intransigent crime problems like gangs and gun violence or the sale of drugs. So we all have to be collectively smart and invest in those strategies that prevent crime from occurring in the first place. We would all agree, I believe, that we would much rather see a 15-year-old engaged in in a way that prevented him from committing a robbery than we would prosecute that same 15-year-old for a robbery that's been committed. So by strategically investing in our neighborhoods and our kids, we are trying to proactively prevent crime. Take one example. In our office in uh, 2011, we started an initiative called Saturday Night Lights. We call it Saturday Night Lights because Friday Night Lights had already been taken by the TV show. And what it is, it's a youth initiative. But it's not just any initiative. This initiative last fall got the Attorney General's uh, Contributions to Community Partnerships for Public Safety Award, which is awards that are the highest level awards that the U.S. Department of Justice gives out. This program, Saturday Night Lights, provides world-class sports training to kids, boys and girls, 11 to 18 years old, in a safe environment, Friday and Saturday nights between 5 and 9 p.m. The kids most at risk, the days of the week they're most at risk, the hours they're most at risk, and the age group that's most at risk. Since we started this program in 2011, we now have enrolled more than 3,500 people. We also provide for this group truancy prevention and tutoring through a program we call Advocate to Graduate, because we understand that when parents bring their kids into the gymnasium to work with our experts, with our, with our pro coaches, they're also interested in making sure their kids aren't just good at sports, but that they're going to graduate from high school, and they're going to improve their education. It's important to me, it's important to the families, and not as much to the kids, but increasingly important to the kids, that we're helping them make sure that they are educating themselves so that they can take advantage of every opportunity. Next month, we are opening our ninth Saturday Night Lights Center in the very development, Manhattanville Houses, which was the epicenter of last week's West Harlem gang tape down. So that's a situation where we need to take out from that neighborhood those people that are causing the neighborhood to fall apart. And then, as a DA's office working with our partners, we need to invest in that neighborhood to keep that beach once we've taken it. And we do all this because protecting kids and keeping them out of trouble is, I believe, a crime-fighting strategy. So I'd much rather watch one of these kids get a high school graduation than see them in our courthouse being prosecuted for gang violence. And I think everyone here would say the same thing. Now, some of the most important reinvestments we make today are in our public infrastructure. High-tech security cameras, particularly in and around public housing, are vital for the assistance in our office and the police to build cases so we can prosecute them better and also to prevent crime. As part of our extreme collaboration initiative with Bill Bratton, uh, we are going to provide the police through a partnership with more than $20 million as a beginning investment from forfeiture dollars recovered in criminal cases to pay for new technology. And that money will go for security cameras, fiber optics information systems, and handheld tablets we hope will feed the police officers data about suspects in their neighborhoods real time. And as Bill alluded to, through forfeitures and settlements of large financial institution cases, which we do a lot of in our office because of our expertise in white collar crime, we are fortunate to have brought in more than $1.1 billion to invest in the city of New York since 2009. As I've said many times, that's a good return on investment for an agency that has an $80 million tax levy budget we've returned $1.1 billion. And we are reinvesting and investing in law enforcement projects all around the city and state because we think we're investing in projects that will make a difference all across the state. We're funding technology infrastructure in courtrooms all around New York City so our assistants can try better cases in front of juries and win more convictions. 
We're trying to ensure fairer and speedier trials through the efficient display and handling of evidence around our courthouses. We are funding the expansion of telephone forensic technology, license plate readers to aid and uh, the apprehension uh, of criminals and Homeland Security throughout the state. And recently, we have funded the Mayor's Task Force on Behavioral Health and the Criminal Justice System, which we hope and it intends to develop a realistic plan to better address the needs of those individuals who have mental health problems and come into our criminal justice system. And those are just a few examples of how we're investing these dollars back into our communities. Now, I began my remarks today with the observation that any business that starts in Manhattan and to stay in business in Manhattan has to be innovative, innovative, it has to be proactive, and it has to invest in our communities and in itself. We aren't content to hit some reasonably good marker of success and then coast on our record. Manhattan and New York City is no longer a place where the achievement of some arbitrary metric means we have to stop trying to achieve more. This is true no matter of who you are, where you came from, what's your station. Every great Manhattan enterprises from the corner of bodega on up has to innovate, it has to invest, and it has to be proactive. It's true of our artists, of our teachers, and it's true, I know, in all of you in this room and the businesses in which you work. Today, in 2014, compared to where we used to be, as you all remember, Manhattan is a very different place. It's no longer a place where we accept that there's always going to be a little bit of crime, and keeping it low means we've done all we can do. This is no longer a county in a city where we write off a single block as ungovernable. This is no longer a Manhattan where we will cede any ground to any criminals or organization anywhere in Manhattan. This is a Manhattan where I believe the ambition of our crime-fighting strategies matches the amb ambition of the entrepreneurial pursuits that you in this room undertake. Now, I'm often asked, what's the biggest difference, do you think, or what caused the rapid decline or the, the significant decline in crime in New York City from the 80s to the present? And, of course, we have the New York City Police Department, uh, we have the district attorneys, and many people, including people in this room, to thank for that decline. But to me, what I think is not fully understood, but actually is most important, is a change in expectations around the city of New York that caused this decline. When I was an assistant in the 1980s, every year we expected crime to get worse. And what happened? It did. But over time, this city and this county began to expect that every year crime could and would get better. And what's happened? It has gotten better, we have gotten safer, and each of us in elective office holds ourselves accountable every year to make sure that we drive it even lower. So thank you, Abney, and thank you very much for listening to me today. Sai, so, thank you very much, and we look forward to collaborating with you and your team. Everybody have a great day, and we'll be back to you shortly with our uh, summer schedule. Thank you.